I offer these every week along with a guided meditation. Just click the uh, subscribe link below to be notified through YouTube when I post the latest recording. Or if you'd like to join us live, which would be great, uh, just go into the description section below and follow the link along to be able to sign up for free. So as you may have heard me say before we began, uh, I am just returned from a three-week meditation retreat and uh, still very affected by it. Uh, as you might have noticed in the meditation, I don't know. And uh, I would personally rather talk with you tonight about things like spaciousness, vastness, lovingness, and goodness. But for some time now, I have just felt a growing urgency in myself to talk about uh, what many, many, many people are experiencing, me included, around the world uh, related to uh, political processes broadly and societal matters in general. And um, so I want to explore with you a topic that I'm going to say very bluntly as what to do if you're feeling disgusted. Now, let me be very clear before we go in to this. You can apply what I'm talking about at a personal level, too. I mean, interpersonally, it's not uncommon at all to have to be kind of morally appalled at what someone is doing, to have a judgment about it. Um, close relatives have discussed are contempt, disdain, shaming. These are normal human emotions, normal human experiences. Just about everybody has them. And um, so I'm going to explore this topic from the standpoint of practice, practice that can be applied uh, at the very you know, close at hand interpersonal level. Uh, people you live with, family systems. Uh, you can apply this to workplace situations. And you can also apply it to, wow, <laughs> what might be uh, moving through your mind stream these days. Now, to be, again, very clear, I am not going to tell you what I am disgusted about, and I'm not going to tell you what I think you ought to be disgusted about. And we are going to um, uh, regulate the chat here and insist that people do not put in the chat their own views about politics in any way, shape, or form. Uh, our stewards will give you a warning if you do. Uh, if you persist, we'll remove you from the meeting. And um, this is to create kind of a space here. It's really okay, on the other hand, to share about your personal experience and from the standpoint of personal practice. Like if I were to share a personal experience here, which I'm about to do, um, I have relatives in North Dakota and uh, people I know there who are unbelievably wonderful people. And they uh, are, you know, making political choices uh, in the U.S. election that, for me, are very challenging to, to face, to see. And without getting into the details about why I find them challenging, I can really say what it's like to be with someone that I love and respect, while at the same time just being completely befuddled, perplexed, and appalled about how could they make a certain choice. Do you see what I'm doing here? I'm sharing my experience. I'm not advocating for a position. I'm not trying to roil or rile other people up. So really, 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 let's stay inside those bounds, okay? And I'll be taking a look at the chat as it comes through and um, uh, maybe making some additional comments along the way. I think this is an incredibly important topic. People don't usually talk about it, 
And as I get into this, you will see that historically, uh, disgust has been um, an incredible fuel for some of the worst things humans have done to each other throughout recorded history. And so we have to be really careful around this topic. You know, truly good-hearted, well-intended uh, people can see things very differently. And what one person finds disgusting morally, another person could find absolutely virtuous. So I'm not gonna get into those kind of arguments. Okay, so here we go, buckle up. So, disgust. Uh, it's, it's normal to have experiences in life of alarm, like whoa, or including slow motion alarm. Like it's just getting weirder and worse. Like whoa. Um, it, it's, it's normal for something to happen in the moment or to have a mounting sense of being just kind of blown away by something, appalled by it. Uh, wow, <laughs> you're willing to do what? Or, you know, you, you might have a friend who just, you, real, you discover has been talking about you behind your back. Uh, you might realize that someone who's been an authority as a spiritual teacher, certainly different schools and traditions in Buddhism and certainly other religions have been rocked by the revelation of various teachers who were um, full of wisdom on, you know, most of the time and part of the time were prepared to molest and abuse and exploit their students. You know, things happen. Uh, you're, you, you know, you see a big kid just picking on a little kid. You see, multiple kids ganging up on one kid. Uh, you see people who just are prepared to just lie and cheat. You just, they just are. Like, whoa, you know, this is normal, normal range stuff, normal range stuff. Uh, sometimes we discover things in ourselves that we're just phew, kind of appalled by that part of our mind just hijacked us and did that thing, you know? Uh, we're just like, so mad at ourselves about that. Uh, so this is the territory I want to explore, and I'm deliberately choosing the word disgust, partly because of its biological roots and its role in our social primate nature and its prevalence in our politics, historically, going back certainly through recorded history. Um, and so this is a, a, an important topic. So what is disgust? Disgust arguably was of the seven so-called primary emotions. I think disgust, fear, anger, surprise, sorrow. Notice how they're all negative so far, <laughs> except surprise. I think joy is one and then maybe there's another, but there are others. But, uh, but in terms of basic emotions, the actual neurological basis for disgust is deep in the brainstem. It's arguably the very first emotion. If disgust, fear, and rage, the very first to really evolve. And uh, disgust maybe even first of all, because even very primitive creatures, even like single-celled creatures, <laughs> need to have a, an alarm signal related to something that's contaminating and threatening and ejected. But what do we do when suddenly we find ourselves taking a bite of something that's kind of disgusting? Like we thought that cheese was okay, but it's really rotten or horrible or the meat is like bad or there's just something in the food that's just revolting. But it's very primal. So this very primal and useful signal of alarm uh, followed by uh, a rejection, ejection, bloop, get it away, aversive reaction uh, in very simple animals with a nervous system has gradually evolved in mammals and then primates and then certainly humans to be increasingly um, related to group identity. They are disgusting, we are not. And also related to judgment about 
moral conduct, like that is disgusting, but this is noble, virtuous, and righteous. Okay? Okay. So what are we going to do about it? And you can apply what I'm going to be exploring here with you, and I'll, I will be looking at the chat and responding there. I doubt I'll be able to talk with an individual here. And we may pick this topic up next week, Wednesday, which in America will be the day after Election Day. And we don't know how much things will be resolved by then, but I'm sure <laughs> in some quarters, you know, these this territory of emotion that we're that I'm talking about here uh, will be in the mix for people. Okay, <clears throat> and you can also apply what we're exploring here, if you like, to other people who are disgusted by stuff of one kind or another, or in that territory. Okay, here we go. So my first suggestion is to have a moral view. There is a place for a moral view in the ultimate, in the absolute, in the unconditioned. Things simply are what they are. There, there's, not, there's, no, there's no conceptualizing. There's no categorizing as good or bad in the ultimate. Okay, um, The asteroid that crashed into the Earth 65 million years ago and wiped out 90% of the animal species on the planet at the time. It was an event. It wasn't good or bad. It was beyond that description. Okay. But any living thing, plants, animals, and especially complex, intelligent, social creatures like ourselves, there's no escape from needing to discern facts and to have values, which for humans become in some care, case, in with some with some in some regards, become a moral view. There's no escape from a moral view. It's okay to have a moral view. The question is: Is it a moral view grounded in facts and consistent with important values? Each person has to decide for themselves this. But there's no escape from a moral view. Right. And a moral view may lead to disgust. You know, we may look at some things that seem obvious. I'll give you some examples. So, um, you know, when I watched the film Amistad, Amistad by Steven Spielberg, I believe, Amistad, it was about a slave ship. Uh, or I saw the film, which I also recommend, um, Amazing Grace. Uh, you know, when I went to visiting places in America, in you know, in Virginia, for example, and I saw slave quarters, I, I just felt disgusted. Um, when I was a boy, about eleven, in North Carolina, I think in 1962, uh, I needed to use a bathroom, so I looked for a gas station and found one. I was kind of, and I saw that there were three doors marked men, women, and colored. And at the moment, I was just, I knew there was something really wrong about it. I was, you know, 11 years old. Uh, but when I look back now, I found it disgusting. I see pictures of people just, you know, find, surviving, the, you know, the concentration camps at the end of World War II and being released and just looking at them. I feel disgusted, not by them, but by what happened to them. Honestly, I feel disgusted by what's happening in Gaza right now. So I'm willing to tell you these things. Um, I'm, I don't like bullies. You know? <laughs> I really don't. I don't like bullying. Uh, you know, so there are things that we find, you know, we have, we have a view. Okay, we have a view, all right? And at an early stage, it's useful to explore that view. What's useful about it for you, all right? We can be mindful of it. We can unpack it. What are the body sensations? What are the judgments involved in it? You know, uh, is it telling me something that is worth listening to? This is a place to start, but in general, I think it's not where we should end. It's a, it's natural. It's all right. We're not bad people. That certain that we find certain things disgusting. It we're not bad people. That honestly, what we have found morally appalling reprehensible, um, beyond the pale, 
whether or not we find it forgivable ultimately or ever, you know, even if some of the stuff that we found, we used to find reprehensible now, our views have somewhat shifted, we look at it differently. Uh, all that, that process is okay. It's okay. It's where we start, but hopefully not where we end. Because now from have a moral view, my first suggestion, I'm moving on to my second suggestion, which is to be careful about disgust. It's so primal. It's so powerful. In relationships, it is very, very impactful. If you like have that little shift inside where you are just like kind of disgusted by that part in that other person or their willingness to do that thing, that tends to be discerned by other people and it has a, it can have a lot of, lot of impact on the relationship. I'm not saying it shouldn't. I'm just saying, be careful. Be full of care, careful. Um, and so, uh, you know, when we're on the receiving end of the disdain, the contempt of others, that's hugely consequential. In the work of uh, Julia and John Gottman, uh, they talk about the five horsemen of the apocalypse or I think it's five, maybe it's four. In relationships, one of them is disgust, being on the receiving end of that kind of moral reprobation and judgment. Very, very consequential. So be careful. Also, for us, hey, does disgust feel good? <laughs> In the gag reflex, when you're like <laughs> trying to get it out of your mouth, does that feel good? Morally, you know, does disgust feel good? It might have a little righteous you know, honeyed tip, uh, as the Buddha talked about uh, anger, and but still a poison barb. It doesn't feel good. It's unhappy and it's stressful, all right? Now, be careful about disgust is to recognize that at bottom, it's biological and primal, but what we are disgusted by, what we are disgusted by is extremely shaped by upbringing, socialization, social pressure and other norms. Think about historically views of outgroups of various kinds. You know, the caste system, uh, it was right here on my shelf is Isabel Wil Wilkerson's book, Caste, uh, which applies kind of the notion of caste to uh, America in, in its history of enslaving people, um, as well as obviously, uh, you know, I'm looking for, I mean, it's close to annihilating the native people who occupied this land initially. Um, and think about how disgust has been used to establish group identity and put down out groups. Frankly, think about how disgust has been used in patriarchy to keep women in their place as unclean in various times and reasons. Uh, think about the ways in which uh, disgust for original sin has been used to maintain various power structures, you know? And how often disgust is used by authoritarian demagogues? Obviously the case of Hitler, many others, in which disgust about outgroups has been used to, as a wave, you know, including with mob violence, to carry them off into power. Be careful about disgust. Yeah. And so consider the manipulations in your own mind. What is driving you into disgust? And how much of them are what you really care about versus what's kind of been implanted in you, priming you for disgust? And frankly, think about the payoffs, such as ways to feel superior for those who uh, disgust us. I remember a client of mine who was raised uh, in great wealth in, um, America in Connecticut, although he himself and his family was not wealthy, but they were very involved in that. And he, he, he had, at one point he was trying to explain to me, I was raised much more in kind of a lower middle class suburban environment in, in California, uh, really outside that world of upper class, old, old money. And he, and he went like this, he was like, he was raising a, he was drinking a teacup you know, with his little finger raised. And he just looked at me and shook his head and, and said, NOCD. I <laughs> went, what? What is NOCD? He said, 
not our class, dear. Right? So, you know, there's a lot of superiority that's available in a kind of quiet contempt, you know, or like, they're not even worth getting angry at. Like, it's a kind of disgust. So be careful about that, including the social functions of disgust. Right? Okay. So then my third suggestion here is to see the whole. See the whole. Okay? And this is, this is about, you know, um, not being disgusted that we feel disgust, including it, being mindful of it, you know, having a moral view. There's a place for it. But then second, being careful about disgust. And then third, try to see the whole. Um, come come up and out to the big picture. Uh, I asked Judson Brewer in a, the Being Well podcast that Forrest, our son, runs, and I'm a guest on often. Um, Judson Brewer is a great researcher who's also a great deep meditator. So I asked him, hey, Judd, what, like of all the things you know about your own brain that's going on in your own contemplative practice and path of awakening, uh, what's the, what's the headline for you, a big takeaway? And he said, Opening or contracting? Contracting or opening? And disgust is contraction. We contract around the disgust. We curl over around it. Our world narrows. Our perceptual field narrows. We're caught by disgust. We're identified with it. We're hijacked by it. Alternately, my third suggestion, see the whole. Big picture. For example, can you see the whole person that you feel disgusted by? Um, you know, there's a line, hate the sin, love the sinner. You know, you could translate that in various ways. Uh, I'm being loose here. But in other words, uh, it's really important to be careful about essentializing or reducing the complexity of others to a particular bloop thing and to lose sight of the way they are a mosaic with, you know, 10,000 tiles or at least 100 tiles. And, um, and, Maybe two of them you find just repelling and appalling and stunning and like, whoa. What about the rest of them? Right? What is not disgusting? What are their own hopes and dreams? There's so much about them that we typically do not understand or know or find disgusting. Can we see the whole of that other person? Can we also think about the many factors leading them to do those things? that alarm and appall you? You know, what's their own background? Frankly, what's their, their, you know, what have they learned in life? What are the cultural influences on them? What do they take for granted? What seems self-evident to them that to you is, is mind-blowing that, you know, they think that or they value that? Um, what's going on there? You know, think about the pressures on them for group identity. Uh, the peace they need to make with their own neighbors to be able to have a business in that town. Uh, you know, the things that they need to learn to not see, to be able to keep the peace with their spouse and their partner. Uh, you know, what's going on there? And also in terms of seeing the whole, not just about individuals, but others, uh, what's the impact on you and them and others? What's the price, the cost of helpless outrage or um, just hatred. I was talking recently with Paul Gilbert, maybe one of the world's, definitely one of the world's leading experts on compassion and especially inhibitors of compassion, obstructions to compassion. Looking at Paul Gilbert and his work, including one of his books maybe from 10 years ago, The Compassionate Mind, leading scholar and wonderful being, um, he was just talking about how the UN and, and, and organizations in Europe that are interested in trying to find a lasting peace between different groups you know, in the world, and we could certainly apply this including inside countries like inside America, it gets to a point where the people in the groups hate each other. They're not just trying to pursue their own advantage, maybe with some lying and cheating along the way. I'm not defending that, just naming it. I'm making a distinction between pursuing your own advantage 
and you know not really caring about who you run roughshod over to get what you want that's bad enough but even worse what happens when you hate the people you're running roughshod over and you're delighting in hurting them and in fact to maintain group identity, you're engaging in what's called performative cruelty, you know, as a way of establishing group identity. That's pretty, pretty, really consequential, you know, very consequential. So see the whole, see the cost. If you're getting revved up yourself and we're vulnerable to getting revved up in these ways, you know, we're vulnerable. Um, ask yourself, is this worth the cost? Is this worth the cost? Maybe there's some short-term gain, getting revved up, feeling superior, feeling righteous, like it's simple, it's easy, uh, it's comfortable in a way. We don't have to think too hard about it. Oh yeah, them. Well, what's the cost for you? See the whole, okay? My fourth suggestion, find what's under the disgust. I saw a comment there, and I'm going to take a peek at the chat now, um, kind of back up there, that for this particular person, under their disgust was anxiety, all right? And um, by the way, to go back to one more thing, when you, when you think about you know, seeing the whole, maybe there's common ground where you can agree on certain things. Maybe over here, you're just kind of appalled that they're willing to go there or do that or think that, but okay, whatever. But over here, we can work. We can work together about putting up a stop sign next to our kid's school. You know? um, so what's the common ground? So what's under the disgust? I think that's my fourth suggestion. What's the fear that's under it? What's the sorrow and what's the love? I find for myself that it has really helped me because <clears throat> uh, disgust is caring. If we didn't care, we wouldn't be disgusted. If we didn't care about what we're about to swallow, we wouldn't you know, have a disgust reaction to it potentially. Uh, we would just swallow it. Uh, and if we you know, didn't care about what's happening in a relationship or what's happening to our kid who's being bullied by somebody, or if we didn't care about basic principles of decency and fair play, tell the truth and play fair is foundational to all relationships. Why is it not also foundational in our politics? When it's not foundational to human politics, which fundamentally is about the use of power, um, it ruins societies. So, um, you know, we can have a lot of, re you know, we can have these feelings as I do, because we care. Well, what's a, what's what's a healthier alternative to disgust? I find for myself it's sorrow. Sorrow about where things are going or how other people are being treated or injustice that will not ever see a courtroom. Uh, mistreatment that will never be rectified, you know, sorrow. Uh, sorrow about the beings around the world who will inherit the effects, the most vulnerable people on the planet who will inherit the effects of things like global warming, species, non-human species, plants, bugs, who we don't even know exist as a species deep in the Amazon rainforest, gradually being driven to extinction by human activity, uh, ultimately driven by greed. Um, you know, we can have a lot of sorrow. Uh, Paul Gilbert actually talks about the movement from um, shame to sorrow, both about ourselves, but also looking at others, the movement from disgust to sorrow. And perhaps even more profoundly, uh, the love that's underneath the disgust. You know, it's easy to get caught up in what we hate, what we're disgusted by, what we have aversion toward, what we're trying to prevent. The brain has a negativity bias, right? It tends to go there. But can we, on the other hand, deliberately shift our focus to what is it that we love? 
that is um, being highlighted by what we're disgusted about. Do we love justice? Do we love other people and we don't want them to be hurt because we love? Do we um, love the natural world so we sorrow when we contemplate the you know gradual extinction of many species, um, the desertification of growing parts of the world, you know, it's because we love, right? Uh, we love those that we uh, are allies to, who are being grievously, unjustly mistreated. We love. What's the love under the disgust? That kind of goes to a comment I made uh, before we began formally about what I've been learning recently about carry your wound into love. Take your wound into love. Not denying the wound, not denying the moral view. That was my first suggestion. Have a moral view, it's okay. But move it into love rather than disgust. My final suggestion is to make a plan. Disgust is a primal signal of threat. Maybe there is something threatening. What's your plan? To, to exercise the power you do have and as part of your plan to find a way to live in peace with what is beyond your control. What's your plan? You know, what are you gonna do? Uh, if you're kind of appalled at what you've realized, that we had a moment with our daughter um, in um, middle school when we realized that a teacher was actually picking on her. And we found that disgusting <laughs> in a way, you know, and uh, we did something about it, which, you know, added to a number of other complaints from other parents that led to the early, you know, to the retirement of that teacher, um, I think appropriately. So, you know, make a plan. What are you gonna do? You know, if you have certain views about um, you know, decisions being made at the, you know, in America politically, uh, what are you going to try to do? And maybe you realize my plan is to cast my ballot and then turn off the television. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and I have a couple of friends, <laughs> I basically say, under these conditions, let me know what's going on, right? Uh, but otherwise, you know, like, I'm I'm out of it, you know, like because you know honestly, uh, it doesn't touch my own daily life, and and I'm just maybe that's your plan. Maybe your plan is to, you know, join you know different programs or groups that try to bridge differences across the divide. Maybe your plan is to really uh, move into support um, uh, for other people that you really really care about. Uh, I'll tell you a story. I think it's okay for me to tell you this. Um, I happened to stumble into a small dinner party for um, our representative and where I live in Northern California, Jared Huffman, who's a Democrat, So, and that's contextually important here. Uh, and so this was shortly after the, tooth, the um, 2016 election, uh, which resulted in uh, Donald Trump uh, becoming president. And uh, those of us sitting around the table were in various stages of shock, dismay, and disgust. And uh, we looked to Jared, who is a U.S. congressman, U.S. representative uh, there, um, who was quite candid and, and really quite wonderful. And we said, well, well, what can we do? And he said something I've never forgotten. He said, send money to lawyers. Wow. Send money, in other words, to civil society groups that will work the legal system in America uh, in, in various skillful ways. Now, you might disagree. You might be someone who was glad that Trump got elected in 2016. Okay, I'm making a general point under the heading of make a personal plan, and your personal plan might include doing what you can to support the causes that you care about. And to know at the end of the day, you probably are not determinative in the whole outcome. You know, your single vote is not going to be the one that decides everything, or your single, you know, ten or hundred or thousand dollar contribution is not going to be the tipping point. But still, you, it's been a tipping point for you because you know in your heart you've done what you could.
Okay. All right, let's take a look at the chat. Uh oh, Pandora's box. What's going on here? What do we have? Let's see. Um, wow. So people are sharing some things in the post that, um, you know, um, that are really quite profound. And yeah, uh, some things maybe are even beyond disgusting. Like horrible, horrible. And, um, you know, okay, so I'm just scanning here. I understand people who feel like uh, there's, we're helpless. I wrote a piece called Vote, which went out in you know in my newsletter, The Just One Thing. And basically it says that we vote, not just at the ballot box, we vote 10 times a day or more when we make moral choices. And uh, very often uh, the choices we make actually do not change things outside us, but they change things inside us. Because we know how we have voted inside our heart. We know that we've been brave enough and um, bold enough to cast a vote inside the inner ballot box about what we truly stand for and who we stand with. And uh, even if we can't change anything. So it's worth doing if only for the effects on you. So someone's asking, I see Gina at two minutes past the hour, why be careful with disgust? Uh, well, because disgust is extremely costly. Once in a while, maybe the benefit is worth it. Like that primal sense of disgust when you've like suddenly you've got something in your mouth that's that's crawling. <laughs> it's alive. <laughs> but past that narrow point of usefulness and uh, being an alarm signal that orients us to things that are potentially dangerous, threatening, uh, I think disgust is really, really consequential. And it's... You know, it's something to be very, to, to, to handle with care, you know, handle with care. It's a normal experience, but handle with care. That's, that's what I mean by that. And I appreciate Irma's comments there about that. Okay, let's see if anybody has a question or comment. Uh, can I touch on the other factor under fear? Yeah, disgust is an alarm signal, right? And... So it's natural initially that when we're alarmed, that we freeze, we recoil, we attack, fight, flight, freeze, appease. You know, maybe if there's an authority figure who we, you know, we're, we're kind of disgusted around or something, but we're, we, we, we start appeasing them, you know, just to kind of in the moment, you know, fear is there. It's, disgust is a threat signal, as I'm saying. But then the question becomes a lot, is it inherently disgusting? You know? Um, the You might be aware of what are called implicit bias tests, where, you know, they'll flash certain images or pictures or words and then ask you to react quickly to them. And there's often a lag time in group with, from between, there's a difference between in group and out group. And maybe that initial reaction for the first half second or two seconds to that other person, you might, you know, it might come up initially. Oh, kind of like, hey, that's kind of, ooh. Think about that applied, gosh, to outgroups of various kinds, to, you know, people, disability, disfigurement, um, related, for example, to things like gender identity. Um, sexual orientation, et cetera, et cetera, body shapes, you know, maybe the first quarter second, which is these studies tend to capture the first one half to two and a half or so seconds. Uh, maybe that's just an ingrained reaction. You have that. That's how you were brought up. That's the reaction. But okay. It's not where you go. As soon as you're aware of it, you don't live there. You don't identify with it. You go, ooh, to that reaction. You don't like, you don't want that. You don't want that reaction. Right? There's a place for that. Um, and um, I think that's okay. It's okay to name that initial reaction, but not feel like that's your 
where you really land. You know, that's that's really important um, here. So yeah, cultural conditioning, exactly, Brenda, exactly what you're saying. So I, I basically want to just kind of step back here. Basically, think about the degree to which, if you're at all in aware of political commentary, most of it is about how the other side is disgusting in one way or another. Can you believe the latest? I can't believe that. And it's sent out as clickbait, actually, because that's what people will hit in the algorithms on Facebook, Twitter, and other forms of social media. That's what they'll send us. Um, it, it's really okay to pull back to a cooler, calmer place where we have a moral view. We see what we see. We value what we value. We plan what we plan, and we act accordingly. That's okay. We can do that. And we can do that with other people uh, without needing to be disgusted. It's interesting sometimes to be with others who are disgusted that you're not disgusted, right? And um, that's where I think being able to be solid in, hey, well, I am disgusted by what you're disgusted, but as the Buddha put it a long time ago, and you don't have to refer to the Buddha if you don't want to, it does not invade my mind and remain. All right? I share, I see what you see. I share your values. I share your priorities. I'm signed up for this action, but you know, I'm just not gonna rest in revulsion or outrage. I'm not going to rest there. Like, yeah, it arises and I I can feel it, you know, but I'm really not going to have it be like the central center of my gravity here. I don't need to have outrage or contempt to have a clear moral view and to take effective action within the circle of what I actually have influence over. I think you're right, Liz. There are people to be genuinely afraid of and to realize, wow, I didn't see that coming, but now I know. I now I know what they're prepared for. Central to Buddhism, deep in its roots, are what are called the Brahma Viharas, or the heavenly abodes, the divine abodes. Essentially, these are four human qualities that are very developed in people who are very far along, and which we can also find and develop increasingly in ourselves. And you might think of each of these as antidotes to um, the cause of disgust. The first of them is uh, kindness, resting in kindness. You know, can we rest in kindness uh, in general? And maybe we don't, we can't find a genuine sense of kindness for that other person or group that we're appalled by or that particular individual, we just can't find kindness, it's not real. But at least we can rest in kindness for those who are neutral for us, or even a little annoying, but not completely aggravating and appalling. And we can find kindness for others and we can find kindness for ourselves. Kindness, kindness, heavenly abode. Compassion, uh, for myself, uh, it's I can easily find compassion for uh, I'll name a particular person, uh, Saddam Hussein. Brutal, terrible dictator, appalling, horrible. Uh, the, his treatment of the Kurds, poison gas, his own people, Saddam Hussein. And yet, you know, uh, he took himself and his country down a path uh, that eventually resulted in the death of his, his children, his sons, and eventually his own death. And you know, I honestly feel both like appalled and disgusted by him and compassionate. And, you know, and I, I feel the capacity. And compassion is a recognition of their suffering independent of a moral view. And fundamentally, a universal wish that's not, um, that's, that's entirely unrestricted in the language of the loving kindness sutta, the metta sutta, omitting none. No one is omitted from this field 
of wishing that beings do not suffer, right? Uh, including the mosquito <laughs> that is trying to get you, uh, wishing that they do not suffer. And so compassion is a great refuge. Also um, kind of what's called generous joy, altruistic or um, joy, sympathetic joy, where we're happy for others. We're glad for them. Maybe it's impossible to find a gladness that uh, they have had a victory um, that they cheated their way into acquiring. Okay, but where else can you find that gladness for the well-being of others? This is medicine to the heart. You can feel it as I talk about it. Kindness, compassion, uh, a generous joy, a generous happiness, gladness for others. Um, you can find that in your heart. It's very soothing. And then fundamentally, as someone was acknowledging here, equanimity. Yeah, ole, equanimity. Balance. Equanimity is not the absence of reactions. Equanimity is not reacting to your reactions. Disgust may arise. Can we relate to that disgust with a stability of equanimity that's like a shock absorber or a spaciousness around it? And then on the basis of that equanimity and helps us find our footing in, a, in shaky ground, um, can we then engage practices like the ones I've named here uh, for those reactions that we may have? And I do believe, to finish, that two things. First, that as individuals themselves deepen in their practice and you know, grow that keel in their inner sailboat further and further down so the winds blow, but they don't knock us over. Uh, as people do that, it has ripple effects in social networks and communities. And as we ourselves, disgust feeds, dis disgust feeds on disgust and in a, often a provocative back and forth way. Um, when individuals in a system, like a family system or a community or a neighborhood are upright and have dignity, being careful about threats that are real, but if it's okay to do this, who stand for their values and you know put their sign on their front yard, as I have, and my wife and I have, uh, et cetera, um, but are not disgusted but can, and can have discussion in which they're not disgusted. That can ripple through larger systems in ways that can be very powerful, particularly as the number of people who can have a moral view without being invaded by disgust that remains uh, grow in their numbers. The last thing here is that I've been reflecting a lot about America and history and the world and, and groups and large groups like countries. And if you look at it, whether it's a schoolyard in third grade or 12th grade or other kinds of things uh, or our politics today, there's been a struggle between viciousness and love, many struggles between viciousness and love throughout human history, including in the world today, at many kinds of scales. And viciousness often prevails for a while. But in the long run, I believe that love always wins. I believe that it has always won in the long run. And sometimes, unfortunately, that run is very, very, very long. What's the line, you know, uh, the arc of history is long, but it bends toward justice. Maybe that's from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And love wins. That's been our history, and it will be our future. So with lots of appreciation for you and respect, take good care, and I'll see you next week. <laughs>